All right, good evening, everyone. Um, happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so this evening's presentation um, will be presented by both Helen and myself. Firstly, Helen's gonna talk about India or parts of India, um, and then she's gonna pass um, over to myself and I will continue on chatting about Sri Lanka to you and the wonderful wildlife that can be found in each country. So um, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, we're gonna follow the usual format, which um, I believe lots of you aren't here for the first time, have been to our talks before, so know what that is in that um, we have kind of will do questions at the end. So if you have any questions as we go, just um, type them into the chat forum, which is on your screen, and we'll um, come around to them once we've finished our presentations. Um, and for anyone who this is the first time joining our evenings, a special welcome. And um, we will also be doing a poll at the end. So if you don't mind just um, filling that in, that would be really appreciated. Um, so I'm going to hand over the, the microphone to uh, <laughs> Helen, who's going to take it from here for a little while. So enjoy. Thank you for your cyber microphone. <laughs> Okay, hi everybody. Thank you as always for joining us. I can't quite believe that we're pretty much now a year into these presentations. And uh, India has been covered on quite a few occasions. So tonight I'm going to try and make it a little bit different. However, if you did join us a couple of weeks ago, um, that you would have been aware that uh, I did uh, a couple of evening presentations on where to see big cats around the world. And of course, India had to be included. From a wildlife perspective, I would very much say that when you're considering India as a destination, there's pretty much going to be one big cat that comes to mind. And that, of course, is the tiger. Now, tigers can be found throughout the subcontinent in fairly concentrated areas, obviously because of encroachment uh, with human habitation. But if you did join us two weeks ago, you would have seen or would have seen for yourself that I was fairly excited about the fact that within or this time next year, there is a chance that if you go to India, you will be able to see five big cats in one country and in one holiday. <clears throat> now that's pretty epic. At the moment, we can offer you four. So uh, we, we have our India Big Cats uh, group tour that goes out every February. Um, 2022 is going out on the 1st of February. We have one twin or double room left available on it. 2023 is already full. And what lies in wait of those intrepid clients heading out to see India's big cats will be on arrival into Delhi. They will be hot footing it straight up into the mighty Himalayas for the chance to search for snow leopards. After a week in that region, coming back through Delhi before heading across to the far western side of the country to the state of Gujarat, and to Gia or Sassangir National Park, which was set up solely to protect the remaining Asiatic lion population that the subcontinent is home to. After spending time in Gia, uh, the group will be traveling down to Nagaholi National Park down in the south of India. This is pretty much a firm favourite with wildlife worldwide now. And this is where you would have the capacity to look for tiger and also for leopard. Not just any old leopard, but more on that later. So that's four cats. You've got snow leopards initially, Asiatic lion afterwards, and then down in the south, the chance to look for tiger and also for leopard. So what's the fifth? Well, the fifth is going to be in central India. And the fifth will be cheetah, which is super, super, super exciting. Essentially plans are afoot to relocate a number of cheetah from South Africa 
um, and relocate them into the central parts of India, traditionally tiger and leopard territory. And uh, they used to exist there until we hunted them to extinction. So plans are afoot to reintroduce them, which is just so fantastic because it means that you then have the capacity for the five cats um, as discussed. So on this particular trip, we have covered cats a little, well, quite a bit already, but I'm just going to very quickly recap. So the snow leopard that you can see here on the very top of the left hand crag, um, incredibly sure footed, these creatures. Uh, snow leopards, this is not an easy trip in terms of the fact that you're dealing with the cold because we're going in midwinter and you're also dealing with altitude. So where the lodge is located, you're talking about three and a half thousand meters above sea level. You need a, a general level of fitness. You don't have to be super fit. Obviously, altitude uh, is indiscriminate in uh, uh, you know, sort of how it affects people. Um, but we have a couple of days in Leh, which is the capital of the Ladakh province. And those are to acclimatize before then going up to three and a half thousand meters to spend five nights in this area looking for snow leopard. There's a lot of driving, searching through scopes and through binoculars over the valley in order to find them. But after your snow leopard, we then, as you saw, bring you back to Delhi and across to the west to Sassangir National Park. Here you will spend time looking for lion. There is also leopard in this park, and there is also the four horned antelope, Chowasinga, um, which you may well be coming across, which would be fantastic. After that, heading south for your more traditional Indian big cat, um, who is ever going to tire of searching for these incredible creatures? So down to Nagaholi, where you're going to have a chance to look for uh, tiger and also, of course, or leopard. So that's our big cats trip. But what I don't want to do this evening is simply just regurgitate information that we've already gone over in previous presentations. So what I would like to do before handing over to Sarah is just spend a little bit of time covering some of the other incredible wildlife that this subcontinent has to offer from the Himalayas to the tropical jungles down in the south and the humid areas to the salt pans and desert of the west, there is something for everybody on this continent and you can essentially do as much or as little as you like. Now what we're going to do is we're going to head um, from Delhi. Uh, oh this is the same slide again, this is not what I wanted to do, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> What I wanted to do was essentially move you into an area where it's possible to search in the foothills of the Himalayas, well actually well within the Himalayas, for this gorgeous, endearing creature. This is the red panda. Found at high altitude forests, it actually has quite a large range. It's from Nepal through India, through China, all the way into the high altitude forests in Vietnam, would you believe? But it is rarely seen. And we have an area up in the tea country near Darjeeling and on the Nepalese and Indian border is a national park called Singalila, which is easily accessible. We fly you from Delhi or from Kolkata into Bagdogra Airport and from Bagdogra Airport going through the Darjeeling area, so incredible scenery. It's a five hour drive or thereabouts to get you into Singalila National Park. And red pandas are in this area primarily feasting on bamboo. So although they're called the red panda, they actually are, they occupy their own genus. They're nothing to do with panda bears, despite their liking for bamboo, um, but they also feast on berries, and the time to visit this particular area tends to be between November and March or thereabouts over our winter months. If you go in autumn, uh, so if you were to travel in November, December time, you would find that the area is completely covered in orchids. So there's a botanical 
interest as well as uh, the red pandas and the scenery. On a clear day, you're very close to the Singalila Ridge Trek that is very popular with hikers. And you can see views across into Nepal on Everest um, and some of the other incredibly high peaks in the area. If you travel in spring, it's going to be all about the rhododendrons. March, April time, which is the end of the season over there before the monsoon. And the whole area will just be alive in the most beautiful uh, buds and colours of the rhododendrons. But obviously it's this little guy that people are particularly keen to try and find, the very endearing red panda. Where we stay, this is Harbour's Nest. It's on the top of a ridge. There's only four bedrooms here. They are en suite with a loo and a small shower. The hot water and electricity is generated or powered by a generator. It's only on for a few hours per day, but this will be your base from which to go out searching for red pandas. And you search using one of two methods. Trackers are sent out at six o'clock every morning to go and look for red pandas in the area. You can either wait at the lodge for the call to then join them, traveling first perhaps by a four by four vehicle, and then as close as you can get before then walking into the forests. The walking can be steep, it's often over rocky ground, um, but sometimes you are able to view them from the road, if not even from the lodge. So again, the pace will be slow because you're at altitude here, you're just below 3000 meters above sea level. It's a very simple lodge, it's very basic, but it's comfortable and it does the job in terms of putting you slap bang in great country to try and search for these wonderful creatures. The views aren't bad either. Um, what you will find, it's a good idea to take a good book with you. The weather is incredibly changeable up here. Afternoons in particular can be cloudy, so make sure that you've got a book to keep you occupied if that it tends to be the case. Um, but there's lots of other wildlife up here as well. The bird life is absolutely sensational. There's a lot of leopard um, associations here. Leopards themselves, leopard cat, clouded leopard, you'd have to be exceptionally lucky to come across any of those creatures, but this is their habitat, they are in the area, but primarily it's red pandas that you will be looking for. So that's a pretty special place. Um, so Dan, our manager, has been out here. Nick Garbutt, our, uh, one of our photographers that we work with, has been out here. So we do have some first-hand experience of the lodge within the team. Um, but any questions that you have, do just give us a call. So you can do this on a tailor-made basis if you wish. We can also do a group trip. So this is the sort of terrain that you would be walking over in order to find the pandas. This is one of Danny's uh, or Dan's wife's Danny's photographs of a red panda, uh, generally up in the trees. A monopod is a good idea and a four or 500 meter lens is a good idea because often they're going to be up in the trees. You're shooting against the sun. So if you are a keen photographer, um, just bear that in mind. So also, if we stay in the sort of northeastern part of the country, um, moving out from the Himalayas now and into the Bay of Bengal, an area that I very rarely talk about uh, is Kazaranga National Park. And Kazaranga National Park, pitch, or that you can see the circle with its location over here, it's in the lowlands by the Bay of Bengal, and this is prime habitat for this monstrous, wonderful creature. They literally look like they've been armor plated or made out of Play Doh. Fantastic. The Indian one horned rhino. Now, Kazaranga National Park, it's marshland, uh, it's boggy, it's very tall grasses. So often this is fairly sort of typical. There's water, lots of wading birds as a result, but really it's the one horned rhino that is one of the biggest draws for this particular national park. That being said, there are Indian elephants, 
there are tigers. You have to be very lucky to see tigers over here simply because the grasses are very, very high as pictured. There's also leopard in this area, but it's exceptionally good for uh, swamp deer, which are only found in a handful of parks or Bazaringa as they're generally known. They're only found in a handful of parks across India, swamp deer. Um, and also in this area, just a few hours away from Kazaranga, you can do this as a day trip from your base and your lodge in Kazaranga, you have the Hulok gibbon. Now this is India's only gibbon species and there is a wildlife sanctuary where you can go and see these creatures as well as a number of other primates. So that just adds a slightly different dimension to your trip. In addition, the birding over here is absolutely brilliant. It's a migratory route. Now, Indian rollers you're going to find across the continent, but I just particularly like this photo. Um, but the birding is exceptionally good. And if you are a birder, well, then this area, you may well be aware of a wildlife sanctuary called Eagle Nest or Eagle's Nest. It's referred to as both. And it is easily combinable um, if you're over in this part of the world anyway. So whether you are at the Red Pandas, whether you're visiting Kazaranga, from here, the airport that you use is called Guwahati. And from there, we can take you up to Nameri National Park and from there up into Eagle's Nest. And this is predominantly a birding destination. So if you are big into your birds, this is likely on your radar already, and we can do tailor-made trips up here. There are two camps, both of which are at altitude. You can see we're back up in the high Himalayas here. They're very, very simple camps. So canvas tents, you will be sharing facilities. There's no ensuite facilities. Water is brought with you to the camp um, and it's very basic, but the reward is essentially that your list of species that you can add to your life list if you're a lifer is going to be pretty high. There are a couple of endemic birds up here. Um, there are new birds being found all the time and uh, identified taxonomically into their various categories. This is a Mrs. Gould sunbird, um, just an absolute beauty of a bird. I just love all the colours um, and just, uh, you know, there, there's so much birding up here, it's untrue. So if you went up here, you would probably spend a minimum of four or five nights out of your holiday dedicated to birding in this area. Moving on from there, we're going to come across to the other side of the country now. And uh, so over on the far western side of India, we get into the state of Gujarat. Now, Gujarat offers a huge amount. Uh, and this is actually a trip that very, very much appeals to me. This is a desert landscape over here, incredibly dry salt pans, as you can see from this topographic map. And essentially, this is a trip, um, a group trip that we run once a year, and it's our Northwest India's rare mammals. Now, it starts at a national park called Vela Vidar, and uh, Vela Vidar is renowned for black buck, which is uh, only found in this particular area. We then go on to Little Ran of Kutch, and Little Ran of Kutch is known for the Asiatic wild ass, and I'll be taking you through some photos of the various bits and bobs of wildlife that you're going to be able to see. But this is really, uh, in many respects, this is cat and dog country, some of the very unusual cats, and that's predominantly why we run this trip. So from Vela Vidar onto Little Ran of Kutch, from there, we go on to Jawai, very, very high on my hit list. I've mentioned this a few times in previous um, presentations. Jawai is all about leopard. And from there, we take you in towards the Tar Desert. And uh, from here, this is migratory birds amongst other species. And then finally to Desert National Park. So this is pretty arid, this region. Um, grassland, flat, 
scrubland. And this is the sort of thing that you're going to be able to see. So from Velavadar, this is your black buck, um, which is only found um, in India uh, at this particular area. On to Little Ran of Kutch, which is really the last enclave of Asiatic wild ass. Now, in addition to Asiatic wild ass over here, this is also a Ramsar site. So very important in terms of bird migration. And it's really your wetland birds, your waterfowl that um, will be key species that you see here. Now, Little Run of Kutch is very much a salt pan area, pancake flat, incredibly dry, and the domain not only of the Asiatic wild ass, but also another fabulous creature, the striped hyena. Awesome, awesome creatures. In addition, you will come across potentially jungle cat. And again, this is where we've got lots of the arid loving species. So as I say, jungle cat, Indian fox, like you can see here. Um, you may come across desert fox as well, uh, which is differentiated by the color at the end of its tail. Um, you will also potentially come across chinkara, which is a gazelle prey, obviously, for your leopards and so on. Um, and then we get to, talking of leopards, we get to Jawai. Now, this is in Rajasthan, and many of you potentially will have visited Rajasthan with regards to the cultural triangle, um, you know, starting in Delhi, heading across to Agra, taking in Jaipur, and potentially going further west to Jaisalmer, to Udaipur, uh, to, um, you know, the camel um, market that is a huge event, a big festival at the end of every year. So this whole area is, is not necessarily unknown to many people who have been to India before. But Rajasthan is not generally associated with wildlife. However, the Jawai Hills are one of the best places in the country to see leopards. They live in the caves in these hills. They often hunt by day here as well as after dark. Um, and in addition to leopards in this area, you may also come across Indian wild cat. So again, we've got lots of the foxes, lots of the cat species, and this is why this particular trip is the Northwest rare mammals. We take you across towards the end of this trip to, you can see the desert background here, to an area called Chichan. And this is very important to the Jain people. Um, every year there is a huge influx of demoiselle cranes. Uh, we can see them in countries like Armenia, for example, but they're migratory species. And here they meet in their thousands flying in, just to give you an idea of the sense of scale of how many birds you've got here and of the photographic opportunities available to you once you're amongst them. This is a lovely, lovely shot. And um, we finish off after here going to Desert National Park, which is where we hope you might have a chance to come across the Indian Bustard, which again is another very, very rare species. So in many respects, that's quite a sort of off the beaten track um, itinerary. And I think that's very much why it appeals to me, but also just anything with deserts uh, and cats and dogs gets my vote. So. Um, in a nutshell, that, that's just a real sort of little taster of, uh, you know, other creatures that India can offer from red pandas up in the northeast to Kazaranga and to Eagle's Nest in the northeast, coming across to the northwest mammal or northwest rare mammals, snow leopards in the north itself. And uh, if we then move back down to one of the national parks that I mentioned at the start, we get to Nagaholi National Park. As already mentioned, this is a firm favorite with wildlife worldwide. We do week long trips down here, seven nights staying in Nagaholi National Park, plus then a night at Bengaluru or Bangalore, as it used to be known. British Airways fly straight in and straight out. So it's a, a, a nice sort of pocket size, bite size slice of um, India and the bush in India and it's hugely popular. And we generally run these trips 
sometimes end of November, but usually December through to April. Again, before the monsoon hits, because all the national parks close between May and October for the monsoon. So Nagaholi takes us back to our more traditional expectations of an Indian safari. Tigers, absolutely. I love the fact that there are two tigers in this image, but just the way it's shot. This is a Nick Garbutt image. Uh, actually, no, sorry, this is a Brett Charman image. Um, but Nick and Brett have provided quite a few images for tonight. So thank you very much to them. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I love that you just focus on that one slap bang in the middle and don't really notice the one across to the right. But so traditionally, yeah, tigers, leopard, there's elephants here, there's gore here, um, but there's not just your regular leopards. You probably all know where I'm going with this. And this is home to a melanistic leopard. And he is in his prime, he is mating, and he has really put Nagaholi on the map. So there are a couple of parks where melanistic leopards within India are seen intermittently, Pench and also Tadaba in the central Indian national parks where we more traditionally offer our tiger safaris and also our photographic trips come to think of it. But for this chap, um, he has been drawing visitors in. Uh, he's a huge magnet for Southern Indian tourism. And uh, we have got trips running over the next few months out to Nagaholi to not just enjoy the elephants, the gore, the light, the tiger uh, and the regular leopards, but also to try and see him. I particularly, this is the animal that I think I would like to see more than any other within India. This is Baloo, of course it is. I look at this and I just want to start launching into the bare necessities. He's having a good little back scratch here. So this is your sloth bear. And this is quite a nice little link because sloth bears are not only found in India, but they're also found in Sri Lanka. And uh, Nagaholi, not that far away from Sri Lanka, so on that note, I'm going to leave India and I'm going to pass you over to the lovely Sarah Malcolm, who will continue. So there we go. Um, thanks for passing the mic, um, H, and thank you so much for that um, presentation. Um, I just... can't make myself disappear, so um, I'll just sit here, if that's all right. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> So yeah, no, um, what an amazing um, account of kind of those off the beaten track uh, destinations that we don't, like you say, necessarily associate with that typical Indian safari experience. Um, that's probably, hopefully made up quite a few of you consider going to India or revisiting India if you've been before. It's one of those destinations that you just keep going back to because each time is a completely different experience. Um, but if you find yourself planning to visit Nagahol, and H mentioned that there's a direct flight in and out uh, from Bengaluru and London, um, but if you don't want to fly straight back to London after your safari in Nagahol, um, Sri Lanka is so close. <laughs> and I'm going to try and um, suggest to you that um, you hop on a flight to Sri Lanka from there, um, because it is it is really a short flight away. Um, geologically speaking, Sri Lanka is an extension of Peninsula India. Um, it broke from the mainland uh, during the Miocene epoch, so millions of years ago. Um, and in this time, the flora and the fauna of each country has um, separated slightly. Um, being an island, of course, uh, Sri Lanka, that's led to a lot of change um, a lot of um, endemism has come from that and um, changes so basically there's a lot of parallels between the wildlife in both countries but there's also some really interesting contrasts uh, between the two um, often when people safari in India you'll, you'll visit various different places and as it's such a vast country there'll be domestic flights sometimes involved and these flights are normally about the same duration as this flight, which is direct from Bengaluru to Colombo. So it's really no big distance to travel um, and totally 
um, makes sense to combine a safari in Nagahol uh, with Sri Lanka um, as a result of this kind of um, logistics opportunity. It's kind of just sat there waiting for us. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's an hour and 25 minutes uh, and it just makes that an ideal combination. So we thought, why not make a group trip out of this? Um, and so tonight we're launching um, this new group tour, special, brand new. <laughs> um, and it takes um, just a small group of six people um, to Nagahol to start your safari. So you fly direct to Bangalore, um, Bengaluru, sorry, I'm combining the old and the new, <laughs> direct to Bengaluru, five nights in Nagahol. So that's 10 excursions, safari drives in the park looking for that Bagheera, that um, melanistic leopard, tiger, all the wild, wonderful wildlife which um, H just described. Um, and then returning back to the city for a night before hopping on a morning flight. And then, you know, by the afternoon, by midday even, you're in Colombo. Um, and now arriving into Colombo, it's really not far to reach any of the country's 26 national parks. Um, mm -hmm. But we decided to focus this uh, small group tour um, on a park called Wilpatu. Um, you may not have heard of it before because it isn't uh, the famous park of Sri Lanka, but I'm going to talk to you briefly about why it's a brilliant park to visit. Um, it happens that both Helen and I enjoy a topographic map. <laughs> so back to the topographic maps. And I was actually looking at this map um, thinking, how much it looked like half of a Kind of intersection of an avocado. I don't know if anyone else sees that. You've got that uh, pip in the centre and then that fleshy pulp which makes the, the main bulk of the country or the fruit <laughs> and then the peel on the outside. Uh, but I'm not showing you this map just because it looks like a delicious fruit. Um, I'm using it to just briefly explain uh, the country's topography. Um, very quick summary of it. Um, Sri Lanka is generally compartmentalised into three zones uh, distinguished by the elevation. So this central dark area is, um, is known as the Central Highlands um, and there's some amazing birding to be done up in there um, and there's a few endemic species which can only be seen there such as the purple of purple leaf, purple faced leaf monkey. <laughs> Um, which is, it's an amazing views. It's a really, really beautiful place to see. You've got waterfalls flooding down, you've got tea plantations and just some really awesome species. Um, and then the majority of the country is made up of these plains and they um, kind of flood down um, to the coastal belt uh, and final generalization of topography. Um, and Sri Lanka, has 26 parks, but its biggest park, sorry, <laughs> hence the little avocados I've decided that they're going to feature. <laughs> um, the biggest park is Wilpatu, and that straddles both the plains and the coastal belt. Um, it's in the northern dry zone of the country, so the south is typically considered to be a bit wetter and the north is drier. So the park itself is, is described by this um, dense scrub forest, grass covered clearings, and it's interspersed with these shallow natural lakes. Um, and it's these lakes which help sustain the flora and the fauna of the area. And it's actually these lakes too which have given Wilpatu its name. Um, Wilpatu actually translates as the land of the lakes. So it's quite a romantic sound to it, and it is um, a very beautiful park as well, as you can imagine from that kind of description. Um, to reach Wilpatu, you follow the coast road north from Colombo. So as soon as you land, you'll hit the road and, and be on your way to your safari in just a few hours' time. It's an idyllic park. It's very quiet um, from tourists compared to the more famous Yala and um, Udawalawe in, in the south. Um, it's remained unspoiled and tranquil, and that's because of that main southern circuit established itself as this really popular route um, due to like past history of, um, you know, um, there was some unrest and you all know uh, the story, but Wilpatu was kept off the 
tourist map for that reason. And the wildlife has since absolutely flourished, but the tourists are yet to kind of follow. So luckily for us, um, it means that without the busy crowds that you can get in, in Yala, um, the wildlife here can be enjoyed in peace. Um, and that's a really important part of our experience and what we strive to um, kind of achieve in most of our safaris is, is not to have that like kind of frantic feel about it. You want to be able to relax into a place and just cruise around these roads as they kind of snake their way through the forest um, and, and kind of search for wildlife in an, in an unhurried way. So there's more than 30 species of mammal that can be found in Wilpapu. Uh, it's a really great place to see um, break out song again, Helen, sloth bear. Um, <laughs> so leopard and elephant and uh, so much more. Um, and during this Wildlife of India and Sri Lanka group tour, you'll spend four nights here. Each day you'll take a packed lunch with you into the park and this gives you a full day to explore and enjoy the park and its wildlife. Now Sri Lanka actually has its own endemic subspecies of sloth bear. Um, like I said earlier, with its separating from the mainland and having time to make changes, um, this species has, has actually become a, a subspecies. Um, and it's actually, unfortunately, it's critically endangered. Uh, but Wilpatu is, is the best park to see these um, bear, and it's a really important place for their survival. Um, and you've got a really good chance of seeing them there. It's, it's, they've got high population density, and they're also very confident species in this park. Another endemic subspecies is the Sri Lankan leopard, too. Um, they're quite fascinating because unlike the, the leopards in India, here they're the top cats. They're the apex predator because they don't have any uh, tigers to compete with. Um, and as a result of that status, that apex predator status, they've actually made both physical changes in that they're larger than the um, Indian cousin, but they're also different in their behavior. So they rarely haul any trees into the kill um, any trees and to kill any kills into the tree because there's just no there's no threat of it being stolen by something bigger. Um, there in this photo, it's kind of perfectly um, represents how your sightings of leopard in Wilpatu and Sri Lanka in general are. They're lounging on these boulders, kind of completely unfazed by what could happen because you know what's the worst that could happen? They're the biggest person around. Um, they're pretty confident and they're amazing to see. Um, great sightings, having them out on these boulders rather than kind of hiding away like they can elsewhere. But as well as leopard, sloth bear, Asian elephant, there's mongoose, there's so, so much variety. Um, as I said, 30 different species of mammals. You've also got um, incredible reptilian life, um, but also the bird life is just incredible in Sri Lanka, much like India, you've got um, so much diversity, so much colour, um, as well as the colourful birds, you've got loads of water birds, you've got migratory birds, you've got raptors, um, it's just a really exciting place if you're interested in birds, or if you're not interested in birds, you definitely will become interested in birds, <laughs> I promise you that, and you know, between sightings of wildlife, it's just a great, you know, seeing something as beautiful as this, it's, it's great kind of filler if you, if you don't consider yourself a birder. Um, but staying at Mahora Tented Camp, you're surrounded by this jungle. It's, it's like this lush green that just um, kind of grabs around each tent. And as you can see, you've got this stunning outdoor dining experience. You're really immersed in the park and away from the hustle and bustle and um, kind of forget about the outside world, which is just brilliant. It's a really small um, camp. Um, and after dusk, your guide might come up to you and say, can we go have a look for some gray slender loris, which come out at night. Um, these also endemic, amazing nocturnal species, which can be found in the branches under the cover of darkness. Um, they're very slow moving and um, 
yeah, we can go look for them after you've had your dinner or um, interrupt your campfire, campfire chats. Um, also things like the jungle cat um, can be seen moving around camp at night. So the safari never ends when you're here. As you can see, this, this camp is beautiful. Um, you have these amazing uh, canvas tents and it gives you that real African safari feel um, to be under the canvas, but with various luxuries as well. Um, waking up to the call of the monkeys or um, perhaps even Sri Lanka's national bird, the uh, striking Sri Lankan jungle fowl. Um, they're probably going to become a reliable alarm clock for your safari. Um, but Wilpatu is an amazing park and we just thought that it works really, really nicely to compare and contrast um, with Nagahol and that's why we've put it into this new group tour uh, for four nights and once you've finished those four nights you just have one night in this beautiful beachside resort before you then fly direct back to the UK. Um, but Wulpatu also is a park that we feature in our Off the Beaten Track group tour in Sri Lanka. Um, it's the last of the four parks, which um, you can see marked out here, that we visit on this itinerary. Um, and we actually have a group on this tour currently um, which is really exciting. It's so great to have people traveling, um, seeing the wildlife um, at the moment um, with all that's going on in the world. So um, as we speak, they are hopefully asleep um, in Kumana Tented Camp. Um, and that's the marker in the bottom right of this map. But the first camp on the off the beaten track itinerary is the camp called Ashpakuna. Um, and this is just south of the Central Highlands. So it's a short, uh, well, a, a few hour drive from Colombo to reach this camp, but you don't actually reach it by vehicle. You get most of the way by vehicle and the last stretch into camp you actually walk in. Um, it's a walking camp and it's just incredibly secluded. So there's no roads, there's no vehicles, there's no sounds of any motor that you can be heard from the camp. Um, and it gives you this really immersive, relaxing experience to start off your off the beaten track, really off the beaten track experience. Um, you'll explore um, the area on foot during the, the whole time. Um, and it's a really great way to see the smaller for, flora and fauna. Um, the camp's also got a, its own water hole, so um, you can set up in the evenings after dinner and look for nocturnal wildlife with your guide as well. But because of its location, it's a very short 15 kilometer distance away from the busier, famous Udawalawe National Park. And although you don't have the tourists coming, the wildlife does filter through. So as well as the smaller stuff, um, you know, you, you could also see elephants when you're out on these walking safaris as well as leopard um, you know the wildlife just makes it own, its own way and this is perfect habitat for it. So in the southeast of Sri Lanka um, is this park that I mentioned called Kumana. It was formerly known as East Yala um, and it's actually contiguous with the main Yala. So while busy crowds don't filter again into this part the wildlife does um, importantly. So Wildlife such as leopard, um, sloth bear, elephant, jackal, mongoose, monitor lizard, mugger crocodile, they're all found here. And it's these wonderful species, as well as loads of bird life, because Kamana is a really, really important place for wetland birds. Um, this is what the group, which I mentioned, are out there at the moment, are going to be waking up in about six hours or so to go and look for. Now we don't have time tonight to cover everything that Sri Lanka has to offer. Just like um, you know, H Helen, she gave you a summary of parts of India. Um, I'm just giving you a summary of parts of Sri Lanka as well. There's 26 parks and there's so much diversity, um, but that's for another evening. Um, we focused tonight mainly on Bulpatu because that's where our new group tour, uh, Wildlife of India and Sri Lanka takes us as well as our off the beaten track um, tour focuses on. Um, but yeah, so much to offer. 
beautiful variety and experience to, to be had in these countries. Um, but if you can't decide between India and Sri Lanka, or you've been to one or the other before, and you're kind of torn, then just do both. It's completely logistically doable to do both. But if you have decided, actually, no, it's India I want to go to, or no, it's Sri Lanka I want to go to, there's so many ways to do it that can suit you perfectly, whether you do it in a group tour, a photography tour, whether you do it tailor-made or do an extension, then there's, there's, there'll be the itinerary for you. Just please let us know, talk to us, and we'll help you in finding it. Um, Helen and I, we've, we've both been to both countries and had amazing experiences in, in each of them. Um, but we're just going to have a quick look at the questions that you sent through and do our best to, to answer them. Um, I'm also going to send out the poll just quickly. Um, so if you don't mind um, putting in your answers, that would be brilliant. Um, and I'll just have a quick look at the questions. So um, Helen, this one's for you. I believe the answer's Pushkar, if you if um, if I'm correct, it's what camel? How, what's the camel market that you go to? Is it Pushkar? Pushkar, yeah. It's usually end of November, beginning of December every year, and it's a massive gathering in the desert. Um, very, very famous. Uh, it's more of a cultural Indian experience rather than wildlife, but um, often included on Rajasthan itineraries. Yes. Yeah, and it's. I think it's a place where there's lots of. Um, I know people bring their best camels and there's trading and there's also horses. Yes. It's a, just like this absolute hubbub of noise and excitement. It's a real. Special. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for those questions. Um, let me see. <laughs> What's the, I like that question. What's the predominant lager sold in Sri Lanka? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should know. <laughs> um, I, I want to say that I, I was mostly Kingfisher there as well, which I know is an Indian lager. Um, but <laughs> I enjoy that question a lot. Um, I actually collect beer labels from wherever I've gone, but I don't think I've got one for Sri Lanka. That's poor. <laughs> you have to let us know if you go there. <laughs> um, we have a new group tour, uh, Wildlife and Lagers of Sri Lanka. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's a question about uh, camera battery charging um, in the remote camps of India and also in Sri Lanka. So I'll just quickly answer for Sri Lanka. There are camera charging facilities available in all the camps, even though they're off the beaten track. So it's just a case of bringing an adapter with you, which we'll advise you on which one you need. And um, Helen, do you want to just answer for India as well? Yeah, ditto. Even places like Harbour's Nest, where you go looking for the red pandas, they've got charging facilities in the rooms. It all comes through from the generator and in the communal areas. So you're always going to be able to, um, uh, you, you know, charge your batteries. It, it, it's becoming more and more standard because obviously everything is digital now and people want, you know, photographs and to keep in touch with the outside world. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And um, we, we are hoping to hear soon from our group till they're out in Sri Lanka at the moment. But as I said, they are off the beaten track. So <laughs> we got to wait another week or so to hear from them. I like um, that. When I go away, I don't want to be contacted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. Well, thanks everyone so much for joining us tonight. And um, we've got our next talk um, is again it's Helen <laughs> Sorry. Uh, desert lover, going from talking about the Indian deserts to talking about um the South Africa Botswana Namibia desert um that is the Kalahari so um yeah if you if you are interested in any of our tours um you'll notice there's a special offer um code on this slide but just please give us a call and we'll all be ha very happy to talk to you about both destinations all right, good, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you.